Are you having a good day at DDD? Yes. Excellent. So this isn't a joke, it is actually a gardening talk. There is no technology, there's no IoT. So this isn't, people ask me, you know, are we going to be surprised by a technical talk? No, you're not. If you think you're here for a technical talk, you are about to be surprised. <laughs> Um, the reason that I came about with this talk is I've done a couple of um, different presentations at different conferences in DC and ScaleConf. People found out I did <coughs> aquaponics and that's all they wanted to talk to me about. So I thought maybe I was in with a bit of a chance. And some of the people I've spoken to today run aquaponic systems or are very interested in it, so I guess that's why I'm here. Um, so I am Vanessa Love. If you saw my talk last year, you know that I have a hobby that takes quite a bit of my time. Usually, I'm employed. Currently, I'm not. But I also like to build things. So like all developers, you like to plan, design, build things, have a bit of control. Now, there are a couple of points during my talk that you, know, you might not agree with. This is one of them. <laughs> I'm a Greens member. I'm a vegetarian. And I believe in climate change. And I really like kale. <laughs> it was one of the reasons I started small space gardening, um, started with hydroponics and going into aquaponics. Kale is one of those products that is expensive, hard to find in bag quality when you buy it, but you can go up pretty easily. So why do people garden? There are heaps of reasons why you might want to garden. As technologists, as developers, it might be just you want to get into the sunshine away from a screen. It's definitely one of those things. You can read them, maybe one of those things is for you. Definitely all of these things are for me. Why not traditional gardening? I mean, traditional gardening can be awesome. I had a house with a lot of space and I built some great veggie beds. They were three meters by one meter. I had six of them, it was excellent. I grew beautiful heirloom strawberries we would have bowls and bowls of them. It was awesome. I grew nice exotic types of zucchini bean things and sweet potatoes. We had over 20 kilos in our harvest. It was great, but there are reasons why it sucked, like weeds. You spend 80% of your time weeding, or at least I did. I bought really high quality organic soil full of seeds of weeds. So I spent so much of my time trying to keep on top of it. It made gardening not fun. And of course, we have bugs. So you grow something and it grows beautifully and then you're feeding the neighborhood bugs. It's not very fun. In Queensland, we can underwater things. It's very easy, especially in winter. It's cold, but in Queensland, we don't get rain in the winter. We have crunchy grass, things dry up, but you don't think about how much you need to water and you tend to underwater things and they don't grow very well. And then of course, like this morning, we just get buckets and buckets of water that drop on us and things can die because they have wet feet. Plants don't like it when their roots are covered in water. So it's something that we as Queenslanders have these unique things that we have to deal with where we underwater in winter, which we shouldn't really have to water at all, and then the sky opens up and all their plants die. And maybe you have no space. I moved from a larger property into a smaller property and suddenly had to rethink how I was going to grow my kale. I didn't have places I could put in large veggie beds. So there are things that you can do called small space gardening and we'll touch on a few of those things. I have some great slides that you're gonna love. I'm unemployed, so I spent a lot of time making really <laughs> bad word art. Um, our climate is different than the southern states. So I'm making the assumption that our audience, we're all Queenslanders, except for the people that have flown up, but I'm gonna focus on Queensland. One of the things to also remember is we were colonized by the English. And what surprised me when I first started to get into gardening was all of the books were based on English systems of gardening. They don't apply to Queensland. We're in a subtropical climate. They apply really well in Melbourne and Tasmania. So you'll buy these books and they'll tell you when to plant things and it just doesn't apply to us. And that's something that you have to keep in mind to successfully garden in Queensland. So all of this led to aquaponics. What is aquaponics? It's aquaculture, which is raising fish in a closed environment. 
That is somebody's fish farm in Florida. You can do that at home, you can raise fish. And a mixture of hydroponics, which is growing plants in a soilless medium with a very um, nitrogen efficient water source. So let's look at a bit of the history. In 1979, that phrase was introduced in, in a state in America. But 500 years before that, when Cortez went to Mexico, he discovered that in, an, in a lake, they were building these floating beds of vegetation. They were farming the fish and the food, and it was able to sustain a city of 200,000 people very, very easily. So it's been in place for quite a while. It had a large feat of engineering. It could, in flood times, drain the water. It could keep the water in. It was really quite cool. Even down to the willow trees that they were growing on the side just to keep the bed stable. But let's go back 2,000 years. In southern China, they have been growing in their rice paddy fields fish. It's something that was done. When Western culture tried to introduce fertilization, all of the fish died and they had really bad yields. So they went back to traditional methods. Now other cultures that are doing this in place now have a 10% greater yield by having fish in with their crops. And of course, it's two food sources. In China, a quarter of their fish production is done this way. So what are the, benef what are the other benefits of aquaponics? you can grow more than traditional gardening. There is more nutrients readily available to the plants, so they're not in competition with each other. It uses 90% less water. That always feels like a bit of a contradiction because my system at home houses 2,000 litres of water. It only has water in it. It doesn't really make sense, but it's not lost water. There's a slight amount of evaporation, but the rest is taken up by the fish. There's no weeding. Ever. Like, in, in all truth, I've pulled two wheats out of the system in two years, and that's just from bird droppings coming past and seeds happening to fall into my system and germinating to whole weeds. So if you want me to put a 99.9% .9 accuracy on that, I can, but there's no weeding. Um, plants grow a lot faster, and I'll get into the science about why, but they grow faster. And it doesn't require fertile soil. So while in my veggie beds back at my old house, I bought this beautiful organic soil, it loses its nutrients very quickly. You have to keep topping it up with fertilizer, all sorts of things to keep the, fo the soil fertile. Or you need to go into a fallow type system, grow green crops to top up the soil, but that means you're not growing things you can eat. And if you're not a vegetarian, you get two <laughs> food sources. So how does it work? Fish poo. Magic happens <laughs> and plants grow. Now, we're scientists, right? <laughs> Science happens. So I'm here today to talk about Agile. No, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the nitrogen cycle. This is how aquaponics works. Without this, you won't get plants, you'll have problems. And then we'll talk about how we can make sure it happens. So fish are in the system. We feed them, they produce waste, there's decaying plant matter, the, the food that they don't eat also is waste. And that's in the form of ammonia. Now ammonia is toxic to both fish and plants, but that's okay, because in the air and everywhere around us, there are bacteria. And nitrosomonas bacteria colonize the system and perform nitrification. So they turn that ammonia into nitrite. Still here, we're in the form of toxic to plants, toxic to um, fish, but that's okay, because there's a secondary bacteria that comes along and says, hey, I'm cool too, and it's called nitrobacter bacteria, and it metabolizes nitrates to produce nitrates. The A and the I. Um, if you have fish at home in an aquarium, this happens. So it's in your filter, it's in your biological filter. At this point in an aquarium, the nitrates will build up to toxic levels. So that's why you have to perform 25% water change every week. Except in aquaponics, you have plants. Nitrate is available as a fertilizer to your plants. So they take those buildup of nitrates as a fertilizer. They grow nice, beautiful, healthy, and then your fish get clean water again. 
So the only inputs into the system are fish food and occasionally topping up the water, but you don't have to change water at all. So what are the components of aquaponics? Obviously, we need our fish and probably some water for the fish to live in and then some kind of container for that. We need somewhere for the bacteria, which is in the form of some kind of media with a very high surface area, and that needs to be contained. So as we've just learned, the bacteria are the most important part. They need it to get rid of the ammonia. So I want to talk a little bit about what they call a media bed or a grow bed, which is this bit up here. Oh, and you need a pump to move the water around. The most common type of bed in aquaponics is called a flood and drain. So as we're watching in this animation, water slowly fills up in the bed and then rapidly floods out of the bed. It's important for a number of reasons. One, we've talked about plants don't like wet feet. So a lot of plants, their roots will rot if they're in water all of the time. There's very few things that, are, that that doesn't work for. Lettuce really likes wet feet. There are some tropical plants, things like watercress, but majority of plants don't like it. One of the super important parts is actually when it starts to drain. When the water floods down like that, oxygen is dragged through the media. And the oxygenation is what causes rapid plant growth. So when you have a traditional soil bed and you water, if your soil is really loose, when the water floods through, it does pull down oxygen. And that's why clay soils are bad because there's not a lot of oxygenation when you water. This happens 50 times a day in an aquaponic system. The air pulling down and the um, aeration around the roots is what causes such healthy plants. And this is one of those, uh, another one of those contradictions. In an aquaponic system, you actually end up with a lot smaller root systems on your plants than you do in traditional soil because they don't have to spread out and try and find nutrients, find air, compete with each other. And that's why you can crowd the systems a bit more. So how do we do this flood and drain? We use something called bell siphons. They're mechanical. They're really easy to build. I've built three, very easy. They're really reliable. They've got no real moving parts. They're not just going to break. They're pretty hard to break. They have three parts, in fact. So they have what they call a guard. The whole purpose of this is to stop media from getting into the bell itself, mucking it up, getting into your pipework. Very important. And then we have the bell, which has to have an airtight cap and some holes at the bottom. And this pipe is smaller than that pipe. The cap doesn't really need to be glued on because I can't get those bastards off. <laughs> And then you have what's called a stand pipe, and this plugs into your drainage outside. Um, an important thing about this, um, you can kind of see that I glued it on wrong and had to cut the top off, off, and that's fine, but the height of the stand pipe is the height of the water that's going to be in your bed. So maybe glue it after you're really certain you've got the size right. <laughs> so I'll show you how this bell siphon works. It works with something called the Bernoulli effect. Um, just to so we've got the guard and those are air holes in the guard and then we've got the bell itself and that's the air holes and then we have the stand pipe that's draining out of the system. So we're going to very slowly watch the system start to fill up. The guard itself allows great water flow. There's no restriction from it and the holes in the bottom of the bell are enough. And what's about to happen is the water is going to cascade over, form an airlock and cause a siphon which is going to rapidly drain the bed. When it gets to the bottom, air is pulled up from the bottom of the bell, releases the airlock, and that stops the siphon. Really quite simple, sometimes really hard to understand. There are great videos online that will show it with clear things. But science, really easy, no moving parts. What can happen though is your water rate, like the water flow into the bed will, if it's too low, your siphon won't initiate and if it's too high, your siphon won't break. So you have to have some kind of tap on your inflow into the bed so you can make sure that you've got that exactly right. And yeah, it'll take you know, a little bit of tweaking now and then to figure it out. Um, I don't worry about it too much in rain. With the rain coming in a bit more, it'll sort itself out when the rain's over. 
And the only thing I really have to do is every day when I feed my fish, go out and just check that if no siphons are running, then I know that everything is working perfectly because they have initiated and they have stopped. If any are running, then I wait for them to stop and just check that everything's working. It's very rare that I ever have to tweak it and mostly it'll be because some filter is clogged. I wanna talk a little bit about the guard itself. There are some videos out there that say you don't really need the guard if your media is big enough to not block, block up your bell siphon. I absolutely and completely disagree with that because by having the guard means you've got more control over maintenance features. You might need to get in there. Roots will get in there. You need to clean them out. You might need to take your bell out for whatever reason. You can't do that if you don't have a guard. So it's a very important thing. You also, with the parts of a bell siphon, because you can remove things, if I take out the bell, I suddenly have a constant flow bed. So a bed that always has the same level of water in it. So if you are growing things like lettuce, spinach, water spinach, watercress, you can keep it at a certain level. You just have to remove the bell. Water will continually thro flow through. Or if you are doing maintenance, you can actually drop the level of the water in the beds by taking out the standpipe. So there are all different configurations with these three parts that allow you greater control over your aquaponics. There was a time where I went away and my friend was watching the system. And I didn't, it was peak summer and I didn't give her great instructions on what to do. And I came back and my tank was almost, my sump tank was almost completely drained. So to rapidly get water into that to help the pump while I was filling it up, I just removed all the standpipes. So all the water from my beds flooded into my sump tank and I had extra water in the system. So let's talk about fish. Local natives are the best. Now the reason I've highlighted the word local is because in Australia we use the word natives and it generally means all of Australia is native to Australia. But that's again not true, we have different zones of everything. So if you pick something local to Queensland, it means you don't have to heat your tank or your fish to keep them alive. So the best fish in Queensland are jade or silver perch. You need to feed them a high protein food for growth, but it's also the best food to produce ammonia. But keep in mind that during winter temperatures, they will slow down their eating. It takes about one, one and a half year to grow fish. So like that's a long time, but during that time you will get a lot of crops. Now I have to say that goldfish are excellent because I'm a vegetarian, I don't eat my fish. But before anybody calls me a hypocrite that I'm not growing fish, I do have a single jade perch who terrorizes the bottom of my tank. He's growing very nicely. My husband named him Larry. So remember, <laughs> pets, not cattle. <laughs> now, high five to anybody who saw that coming. <laughs> All right. You can buy pre-made aquaponic systems. That one, they call a small system. They call it a balcony system for people who might only have a balcony. Um, but it starts to get a bit expensive. You can even buy really fancy systems, but they're really quite expensive. It's not a bad size, it looks really pretty, but I'm personally not willing to spend that much money. In fact, there are all sorts. There are really fancy indoor systems with aquariums, molded plastic, etc. They all have pretty much the same configuration. They come with all the parts, which is something good if you don't have time to put it together, but in my research, they were very expensive. So let's talk about what's going to happen when you start researching aquaponics. YouTube is best. Big damn warning. With the current political climate in America, on YouTube, everything leads to Nazis. <laughs> now, what you also have to understand is there is a group of people who believe the government is poisoning their food and they have decided that aquaponics is the best way to make sure that they grow nutritious food. So unwilling, unknowns to me, stumbled into a bell siphon clip where I got a 20 minute lecture on guns <laughs> before I got the moving pieces of bell siphon. So, you know, just maybe try and avoid 
some of the creators when you're looking for YouTube clips. I think that goes for any topic at the moment though. <laughs> there are heaps of forums. There are local forums, there are Queensland forums, there are Australian forums. If forums are your thing, there are heaps of forums. Um, there are ebooks and books around. It's like, it's not a new thing. And occasionally there are some courses that are run in Queensland. So you could sign up for a course and get more than a 40 minute introduction to aquaponics. Um, this is Rob. He owns a YouTube channel. I am a patron of his. He is awesome. He lives in Ipswich, which is 20 minutes away from me, which means that everything I watch relates to me. The weather is the same. The climate is the same. When he starts to grow things, I can start to grow things. Finding a resource like that is really good because you get to pretty much follow, you know, copy paste, stack overflow your aquaponics. He, I am currently automatically tweeting a few things, like he has a couple of links to the two next systems I'm going to show from start to finish on how to build them, um, as well as just his YouTube is just full of how to grow stuff at home. It's what he does, what he makes money on. And he has some really cheap parts for building aquaponics. Rob is awesome. I stole a bunch of his images. Um, this is one system he built. So for about 140 bucks and a recycled part, you can have an aquaponic system. There is a video on YouTube that shows you every single step to build this system. If you want something slightly bigger, this is called a chop and flip IBC system, about 400 bucks, a couple of weekends, it's yours. So doing my own, what was right for me? When we bought the new house, I wanted as big a possible system as I could on our smaller block. And it's not that the block is really small, it's that it slopes down into this park and that's the one area of flat land I have to be able to put anything on. So my space was pretty confined. <laughs> my husband told me it should not look crap, Vanessa. <laughs> because it's from the park and neighbours would be able to see it and can I not have a pile of mess in the yard? <laughs> um, it needs to be removable in case we ever want to sell the property, so we didn't want anything that was permanent. So it comes down to the design. Oh, I had beautiful designs of building a nice wooden hexagonal pond and then I realised that we're developers and we don't have those tools or skills or patience. <laughs> So I looked into building my own. This is called an IBC. And you're gonna see so much about IBCs when aquaponics. And that's because this is a recyclable, very abundant resource. What an IBC is, is it's a container that's used in the world to move liquids around. So bulk liquids are much easier to ship in thousand liters than in smaller containers. So they put them in these, they're stackable, you can use them on forklifts, they're great. A lot of them are single use. So suddenly I can buy them off Gumtree for about 100 bucks. Pretty awesome. This was the design I came up with for mine, which is a pretty common design. So we have three media beds that go into a sump tank. We have the fish tank over here and then this is a filter. Why a sump tank? As we know, the beds are going to flood and drain. By having more than one bed, I suddenly have a very variable amount of water that would be where my fish would be. And fish don't like that. So to stop stressing out the fish, you have a sump tank where all of the water flows in when everything is draining and the fish themselves can stay in a very level, stable environment. Sump tanks very necessary at this point. So let's look at the water flow up in the system. This runs on, I'm gonna go back for one, two seconds. Well, what I didn't mention here was this is ground level. So we dug a very small hole to put the sump in and that's because if we didn't, I couldn't do a lot of things running on gravity and that would mean a secondary pump. So you need the sump to be at the lowest point so everything can drain into it without the need of a second pump. I could have, you know, chalked everything up to match ground level. It's not going to be hard to fill a hole when we move, but I'm short 
and I didn't want step ladders and all that kind of stuff going around. So we dug it in. So the pump runs singly from the sump tank, which always has water in it, and it just crosses out. So I've got a fairly decent pump that flows to the three beds that all have um, taps on them so we can control the flow to make sure the siphons work. And then there's a continual feed into the fish tank and the fish tank will just fill, fl flow out with gravity. And so the water flow down is we have gravity from the fish tank straight back into the sump tank and then the bells will flood the system when they need to. Filtration. In a single bed system, your media is your filtration. In a fish tank system, you build a solid lifting outlet. It sits at the very middle of the tank, right down the bottom, comes up. There's an air hole here to stop a siphon, draining your fish tank, killing all your fish. Lessons will be learned and it goes out the side. This tank, no matter what happens now, will never drain beneath the level of that pipe coming out. So even if I lose any pumps, my fish aren't going to necessarily die unless they run out of oxygen. But it's one of those safety things. Bad things happen, you get leaks, you don't want to lose your fish because of a leak. But what it does is all of the solids that build up on the bottom of the system are pulled into the middle of the tank. And things like the water flow itself and the fish themselves will move it around and it will suck out. It goes into what they call a radial flow filter. From the fish tank itself, it comes in halfway up the tank in an upward motion, which then falls down. Any really heavy particle will just drop while the rest of the water will flow out itself. So it's a way to remove really heavy particles. You'll still have small particles in your system, but they're easier to deal with or they'll be chewed up a bit quicker by the bacteria. You don't have to do this, but it means that you won't have to do some really heavy maintenance later on if you get rid of majority of the large particles from your system. They can do things like build up at the bottom of your grow beds and emptying a grow bed is not fun or easy and it could be smelly if there's a lot of stuff at the bottom. If you were going to have um, beds that didn't have media in them, you need a moving biofilter, which has small little things with surface area. They're plastic wheels and they'll grow the bacteria on it for you. So that way you can have a raft bed or a constant flow bed that doesn't have media in it if you need. Or if you want to oversaturate your tank with fish, that's another way to add more fish to your system. So let's go through my build. So we bought three IBCs and one was turned into a fish tank by chopping off the top. Really, really easy. You don't need a lot of tools to do this. It's all plastic. Um, the second tank was our sump tank and a grow bed. And there's, there's gonna be like pictures of my dogs not on purpose because they're just in all of my photos. And then the third was two different grow beds. So every single IBC, we cut a different way depending on its need. They're, they're the three configurations. The great thing about IBCs is you get the bed and you get the cage to, to house it. So there's very little waste when you start cutting them up to build these systems. And I've spent $300 on the three tanks. You can spend $300 on just a single grow bed if you're gonna buy it from somebody. Um, one thing to mention here is I got black tanks. They're usually used for um, things, in this case, it was uh, some kind of car oil. You can get them with those things in them. You just have to wash them really well. The fact that it's black means that I don't have to paint it or clad it to stop light getting in, which causes algae growth. So that was a bit of a double bonus. It meant that I saved a bit of money on having to worry about you know, painting it or putting some kind of wrap around the system. Um, next step, while everything was empty, is we just wanted to map out where everything was going to go and where we were going to dig the hole and sort of see how it would look from a bit higher up and deal with it. If anything's full, it's obviously very, very hard to 
move. Um, so we dug the hole for the sump and then placed a cage on top of it. And then in the good old Australian tradition, we used Besser blocks to stack everything up. I did pay for them and not go to some construction site to steal them. <laughs> Um, and then this final configuration of uh, the build. Now, each bed, there's different media you can use for your bed. I chose one of the more expensive ones for a few reasons. So they're called clay balls. They have a very high surface area. They're made from recycled materials. The two major benefits of them are they're very light. So you don't have to worry about too much reinforcement when you're building your system. The second is they're very smooth. So when you're digging around in your roots or pulling things up or planting, you're not gonna cut your hands up or you're not gonna have to wear gloves. You can just use things like shale and rock, but you have to deal with the weight and you have to deal with how hard it's going to be on your hands. And that's a big consideration if you've got kids and they're gonna be digging around and you want them to play with the system, you probably want something a bit softer on hands. Uh, it's about $30 for 45 litres and the beds on the end, which are slightly larger, took seven bags and then the middle bed took five bags. So we had it up and running and it was actually pretty successful and great until we had all sorts of bug problems. So we live on that beautiful park and so do all the bugs in the world. Um, I tried to net it off and it was annoying and ugly and hard to get in. Um, and that's just a nice pretty picture that went there. But we ended up building a hoop house around it. Hoop houses are really easy to build and it cost about 150 bucks to make and only took us about a weekend and it's very solid. It's w covered in this case in um, a 30% shade cloth which gives heaps of light to everything, but also has not taken any type of beating from any storms. It's been up for about two years now and we've had some storms in that time. The air flows so amazingly through the shade cloth, it's not even an issue. Um, you'll find so many videos on how to build hoop houses, but it's the easiest way to do exclusion, but you can get in the system and you don't have to worry about lifting nets and all sorts of things. And it keeps my dogs out because they're too stupid to figure out how to get in it. <laughs> You are going to become plumbing evil geniuses. I needed to get from my 20 mil pump to a 32, um, 320 mil pipe out of my filter and I took four parts to do it. <laughs> It's going to happen. It's you, you've, I've got a reducer to an expander to a reducer to a coupling. Like, and I know all the names of those things and you, you, you're, that, you're that person mumbling to themselves in the plumbing aisle at Bunnings <laughs> with one connector on one side and one connector on the other. And you're just like, I need to make this work. It's just like software. It's just like software. <laughs> oh. So you'll be fine. Um, yeah, and, and sometimes if you go if you go on a weeknight and it's late enough, some in Bunnings employee will take pity on you and try and find that part that you just can't find. I don't know if it's my gender though, so accurate for all the women in the room. All right, get creative. I started planning my system and watching videos and going, I need this much pipe at this length and this many connectors and 45 angles and all of these things. And then I got to Bunnings and Bunnings didn't have half of it and I left in a fit and then I had to go home and go, okay, it doesn't actually matter. I can make do, a 90 degree angle's fine. I can figure this out. Just don't be too pedantic about the size of your pipes or the plumbing or anything like that. It's just, it's not even worth it because you're not going to have the stuff you need unless you have a plumber friend or a really close plumbing supply store, which I do not have, which might be easier to deal with. Um, it's all kind of stuff that you can't order online as well because at the length you need it or the size you need it is just not delivered. So that's fun. Glue is forever. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've, I've got lots of glued pieces that I have no use for now. 
So just try it out first with water. Um, go big or overflow your system. My first slow coming out of the fish tank was um, uh, 32 and it went into a filter and it was pretty much capacity for the system and it rained and I lost a lot of water and almost some fish. To change it to 50 took two weekends and a lot of ingenuity and it's very hard to, an already drilled hole is very hard to expand if you don't have the right anything and I don't have the right anything <laughs> and it's frustrating. So it's better to allow for expansion in all of your outflowing pipes. So let's talk about the maintenance. Daily, all you need to do is feed your fish and check your siphons are initiating and breaking, which you can do while you're feeding your fish. Make sure there are no dead fish or floating fish or anything like that and harvest a lot of vegetables. That's all you need to do daily and that's why I call it automatic gardening. I don't have to water, I don't have to weed, I don't have to fertilise my soil, it all just happens. Weekly, you should really test your water. I'm lazy and don't do this unless something's going wrong. And it's really rare that anything goes wrong for me. So while my fish look healthy and my plants are growing, I don't test my water. <laughs> in summer, I need to add 200 litres a week due to evaporation in the plants and how much they grow. So that's a weekly task. You can, at that rate, use it straight from the hose, but there is some amounts of chlorine in it. So it's better to have a secondary 200 litre tank, which I do have. I fill that up and then four days later, all the chlorine is evaporated and that goes into my system. And then monthly, you should really clean your filter. I built a 200 litre one, so I do it every couple of months. Everything's fine. Um, you need to add iron and potassium. They are two things that don't come from fish or fish food. Uh, fairly cheap, a teaspoon of each a month. And then in winter, it's 200 litres. So summer, it's 200 litres a week. In winter, it's 200 litres a month. So let's talk about um, plant choice and just some final thoughts on gardening. Really consider your effort versus payoff. So for me, kale was a no-brainer. I can grow it from seed. It grows very, very well. It's something that's expensive and poor quality when I buy it from the shops. I will never grow carrots. Carrots are cheap and good quality and a pain in the ass to grow. You'll never be able to grow them in aquaponics. You need perfect soil. It doesn't make sense to put so much effort into carrots when you can get them cheap and in very good quality. I will say that if you want to grow heirloom carrots or something like that, and it's something you want to try, just do it. But if it's just the generic type of carrots and you want to bag carrots, go to the supermarket and buy them. You should really consider that for any of the things that you want to grow. If it's cheaper and of good quality and you're happy with where you buy it, just buy it and spend your time growing something that's more expensive or something that you really love that you can't get. It makes more sense. That being said, your own time is your own. <laughs> Do whatever you want. <laughs> use more than one method. So this picture here, I use root pouches. They're a recycled uh, material thing. They allow aeration. Um, they allow roots to breathe. They're pretty awesome. Because of the way they work, um, because they are breathable, because they're a fabric, you can grow plants in, the, in a smaller container than you would usually need a large container for plastic type stuff. I also have a very small soil garden at the front of my house, um, hydroponics, and I'm about to start with wicking beds. So hedge your bets, have some fun, small space gardening, try a few things, um, especially things like mint. Don't put mint in your aquaponics because you'll never get it out. Put it in a small container. I only have one emotional plant. <laughs> I grow raspberries, and raspberries don't really go well in Queensland. Um, they take a lot of care and a lot of maintenance. Um, I have to do sort of special covering of them. Um, I'm in my second year, so raspberries only fruit every two years. 
So the first year I had to grow them really well and get some canes up to get some flowers, to get some fruit, and they didn't grow very well. And I think I got to harvest six raspberries this year. And they were really tasty and I'm really sure next year will go awesome. <laughs> so just pick one thing like that and make everything else easy or you're going to go insane. Volunteers will be your best performers. Volunteers are plants that just grow from fallen seed. Fallen seed or roots or anything like that because they germinate themselves in a condition they're really happy with, they will grow so well. So it might happen for tomatoes, um, it might happen for lettuce, anything that you've allowed to go to seed is just going to grow really well. Um, I have dogs who like to eat tomatoes and then go outside and put waste on the ground and I get really good tomato plants growing out. Like they're gonna grow where they're fertilized and where they're happy Volunteers are really, really good plants, so consider just keeping them. If you have lettuce that just continually grows somewhere, let it grow and enjoy the benefit. Now, this is one of those emotional things with gardening. People grow something, especially if it's from seed, and they're like, it's growing really well, and then I tasted it, and it was actually pretty bad, but I spent so much time growing it. Pull it out, grow something you like. It's going to happen, maybe it was a bad seed, maybe it's just something you want to try and you don't like. Get rid of the effort once, once you've tasted it and you don't like it or if it's something your family doesn't like, stop it, put something else in its place. There's no point growing something you're not going to eat or you don't enjoy. And um, buy in bulk from wholesalers. All of that shade cloth for my hoop house from Bunnings would have been about $300. I got a 50 metre roll from a wholesaler delivered to my house for about 120 bucks. So have a look online, see who delivers. Farming equipment places are awesome for that kind of thing. I also bought all my irrigation pipe in wholesale and saved quite a bit of money. Thanks. That's it. <laughs>